Okay, we're all set. <clears throat> so I was having trouble on the uh, derivatives of so the third part, and that's part C. Derivatives of the third part? Yeah, so you know how, or question three, so it's question one, two, and three, and then question three says, and ask for some derivative fun. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so I get to draw on the, uh, this little whiteboard again using my mouse, so I apologize for my handwriting. <clears throat> okay, so which one was it? It was part C. So on, was, on the study guide? Yeah, because you know how there's one for chapter one, I mean for chapter two, and then there's another one for chapter three? Yeah. Yeah, it's the one on chapter three, and I could read it to you if you want. That would be good. Yeah. Sweet. So it's f of x is equal to cosine cubed. 7x. Is the 7x the angle? Yeah, it's the angle. Is <laughs> cubed? Uh, 7x. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what's the derivative? Yeah. Okay, so this is where you're gonna use uh, PTA. Right. So it's power, trig, and angle, right? Yeah. So that power of three is gonna come down. And then the new power just is decreased by one. So that right there was just the, the power of the P. Right. Then you get to multiply it by the T. <clears throat> so the derivative, derivative of the trig function. So what trig function is in there? So what trig what trig function do we have? Uh, I'm sorry, I was you cut out for a little bit. Oh, um, I'm sorry. That would be. So the trig function that we have. I think it's my internet though. Could you say oh, that one more could time? Be mine too. I'm on campus, so it might get a little spotty. <laughs> okay. So the trig function is cosine. So the derivative would be negative sine. <clears throat> so that's the T. Right. <clears throat> And then you finally can do the derivative of the angle, which in this case would just be the seven. <clears throat> and then from here, the only thing to really do is just to kind of clean stuff up a little bit. So like you can multiply any constants together so you can multiply the three, the negative seven, or the, the negative and the seven. So it'd be negative 21. Um, <clears throat> and then from here, it's just kind of up to you. The cosine squared could come next or the sine could come next. Uh, for me, I, I have the trig functions with powers on them kind of come at the end, but I mean, that part doesn't really matter.
And there you go. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Oops. So when you were doing this, um, what were you doing different? I might have glitched or you might have glitched, but when you were doing this, what were you doing different? Uh, me? Yeah. I think I was, so I just completely took off the angle front. I mean, the power from cosine. Oh, uh, okay. So I just like said by power <laughs> of two and then just kept the cosine. Okay. Gotcha. Um, I have a question from the first study guide. So the sure. two, two study guides. Okay. Number three, letter F, which was the limit as X approaches zero divided by uh, cos two X, or I mean, sorry, cos two X minus one divided by cos x minus one. I had a feeling this one was gonna come up. <laughs> okay, so with this one, no um, like special limit is gonna apply with it, at least not yet. Um, <clears throat> So we can't kind of force a special limit to come out of there. Um, so our only option is to do something with one of the trig functions in there. And trying to do something with cosine of x is gonna be really hard, but we can do something with cosine of two x. And we can use um, a double angle identity on it. So cosine of 2x, there are three options that we can choose from. So one of them uh, would be cosine squared minus sine squared. Another would be 1 minus 2 sine squared. But the one that's going to be the best is your 2 cosine squared. Whoops. Two cosine squared x minus one. Because then you can just combine your like terms. So the top would just be cosine, two cosine squared x minus two. And then any ideas on what to do from there? Um, can you split up two cosine squared x minus two um, at all? Like like split it into multiple fractions? Yeah, or like, yeah. So like you, you could, can cancel at the bottom. Um, well, you could, but it wouldn't cancel anything out. Oh, okay. Um, so what you would want to do is factor out a two.
<clears throat> and then the top would factor again, because now inside the parentheses, you have a difference of squares. So now your cosine x minus ones will go away. And now you can stick in the zero for x. <clears throat> and now you can just evaluate it and then you're done. So as long as you evaluate it right, <coughs> you're good to go. So like, what's cosine of zero? Um, hold on, let me get my, oh, that's one, one. Yeah. So that's how they got four. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So, so mine's still on the uh, chapter three. <clears throat> and then it's going to be part H. OK. Um, can I er erase the whiteboard? Yeah, you're going to go with that. OK. <clears throat> So which number? Uh, H, so number three, part H. Whoa. Okay. And then that's um, G of X. Okay. Is equal to ln. Uh, parentheses sign. And then the angle of sine is e of x. I don't know if I said that right, but e to the power of x. Yeah. So this looks like what it is. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Okay. Then I think you said it right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, and it's still asking for the derivative. Yeah, it's asking for the derivative. Okay. So with LNs, you know, when you're doing the derivative, doing the derivative of an LN, there's a like a specific format to follow. Right. Oops. So it's U prime over the U. Oh, okay. So in this case, uh, or act for any LN, when you want the derivative of it, you're going to take whatever's inside the LN, which is the entire thing. So it would be sine of e to the x. Right. Actually, I think I saw where I went, where I messed up. Okay, well, we can, we'll just finish it anyway, since it's, okay. since it's there. Uh, and then you take the derivative of whatever you just wrote in the denominator. 
So the derivative of sine is cosine. And the angle stays the same. Um, whenever you do the derivative of a trig function, the angle of the that you're going to use in the derivatives, those are all the same. Like the angles themselves never change. You'll have to multiply by the derivative of an angle, but that always gets multiplied to the outside. Right. And in this case, the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. <clears throat> All right, so we can simplify that down just a little bit. And you can't do this often with LNs, but sometimes when there's like a trig function in there, and then you could. Right. Uh, because cosine over sine. It's cotangent. It's just cotangent. <clears throat> yeah, I was like, how do they get cotangent? And I was like, oh, wait. And then you, you showed me that, and I was like, I'm so <laughs> So yeah, if, it was, was, yeah. if it was ln of cosine of e to the x, it would be um, almost the same exact thing, but it would be negative. And instead of cotangent, it would be tangent. But the process right. would um, look almost identical. Mm -hmm. Just your yeah. trick functions would have been flipped around. Right. right. And a minus sign. Yeah, there you go. All right, thank you. Sure. Okay, um, let's see, what else would you guys like to do? Can we go over implicit differentiation? Sure. Because that was a little confusing for me. Okay. Um, let's see, let me get rid of that. Um, do you want to, did you get the one right on the quiz? Or actually, I can find that out. Like I haven't gotten to that your class just yet. Let's see, I did grade yours. Was it the tangent line equation or, or question? As far as like what you missed? Yeah, because I think that one, I don't think that I got it 100% right. I think I only missed like one or two points on it. Yeah. Yeah, that one was one of the ones I was struggling on. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so your, I think your implicit differentiation was, was good. I think you knew what to do. I just think you changed a number on accident. Oh, okay. But um, we, can, we'll, we can still do it. So your version was 3xy squared. Uh, plus 9x equals 4. And we're using the point 1 third and 1. So the tricky part in where most people were messing up was in the derivative of the 3xy squared because you need to use the product rule there. 
uh, because it's three X times Y squared. So the derivative of the three X would be three and then times your Y squared. And then plus, now it's gonna flip flop. So now I need to do the derivative of the Y squared, which would be two Y. Well, you just took the derivative of a Y term. So now you have to multiply by that dy dx. So that the two y dy dx, that's the derivative of the y squared. Whoops. And you still need to multiply by that three X. <clears throat> so that right there is just the derivative of, the, of that first term. And now you can move on to the next stuff that's in there. So the derivative of the nine X would be nine. And then the derivative of the four would be zero. <clears throat> so the nice thing about this question was it wasn't asking for the actual dy dx. It just wanted to know its value at the given point. So from here, you have two options. You could either get the dy dx by itself uh, or and then plug in the point, or you could plug in the point and solve for the dy dx. And for me, I like that way a little bit better because then I don't have as many variables running around uh, and I just it's almost all numbers except for the dy dx so I'm going to plug in the one for the y to make the first term just three and then plus I have uh, two times three which is six the y is still one uh, the x is one third And I still have the dy dx. <clears throat> so now it's just a little bit quicker um, to, to solve. So like you can add the three and the nine, which is 12 and swing it over to the other side. Six times a third is two. So somewhere, I think you had a, like right here, you had a three Y instead of a two Y. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> Thank um, you. Sure. <clears throat> Did you want to look at the next one as well? That second question from the quiz? Um, which one was that? That was the one with the, um, the arc tangent in it. Yeah, sure. Okay. <clears throat> so the other question had an arc sign, but they're, I mean, they're pretty much the same. Okay, so we need the derivative because when you find the equation of a tangent line, let me back up. Or when you find the equation of any line, you need two things. So what two things do you need to get the equation of the line? Mm 
think you need a slope, right? Yeah, you need the slope. Wow, it looks like I'm in kindergarten trying to write this. <laughs> no, you're good. You need the slope. And you need something else. A. Uh, y term or V? Uh, the Y intercept is nice, but it's not necessary. It just has to be another point. If you have the Y intercept, it's great, but you don't have to have it. If you have it, it just makes your work, your, your last couple of steps really fast, but if you don't have it, it's fine. So you need the slope and you need a point. Do you have either one? <clears throat> yeah, that would be no, because they just gave you the function and they only and the x value. So they didn't say anything about the slope and you don't have the whole point either. So how would you get the slope? Um, you would find any. You would need to find the derivative of the, uh, the equation. Yeah. Get the derivative and the point. Right. How would you get the point? Um, I'm you not sure. Your x value. Oh, okay. Uh, into the original. Uh, and then that'll give you the y coordinate of the point. All right, so let's get the slope. Which means we need the derivative of the arc tangent of x minus four. So it's one plus, and then you take whatever is inside the, the arc tangent and you square it. So that'd be X minus four squared. <clears throat> and then on top, you take whatever's inside the arc tangent and you find its derivative. So the inside is x minus four, which means the derivative derivative of that is just one. And then the derivative of the radical, you need to use the chain rule. So the radical changes to a one half power. So the half comes down. The uh, power gets decreased by one. And then you need to multiply by the derivative of whatever was inside the radical, <clears throat> which in this case was two X minus eight. <clears throat> and again, you, they're just asking for the tangent line. So you don't necessarily need to, you know, simplify this derivative as far down as you can get it because you're only interested in trying to get the slope out of there.
So if you want, you can plug that X value in the four. Think on the arc sine version, it was plugging into the X equals one. But you can start plugging in that value and get the slope out of there, um, which would probably make it a lot faster than trying to simplify this thing all the way down. People were trying to get common denominators, which is fine. You can do that, but you did a lot of work that was just kind of extra. Because if you plugged in the four, um, if you plug it into this first fraction, you have x minus four. So if that four is in there, that whole term that's being squared is now zero. So that first fraction just goes to one. And then if you look at this mess over here, if you plug four into this back set of parentheses, that makes it zero. And anything times zero is zero. So your slope just comes out to equal one. Okay, so now the point, you can plug the four back into the original equation. And we have arc tangent or inverse tangent of zero. And then plus the square root of, uh, we have 16. Minus 32 plus 17. Now you can evaluate that down. So like inverse tangent of zero is what? Zero. Mm -hmm. And then 16 minus 32 plus 17, that's just one. And the square root of one is one. So it's one. So that means your point is four, one. <clears throat> so you've got your point, you have your slope, and now you can jump to the point slope formula. So y minus one equals one. Times x minus four. If you, multiply, or if you multiply that out and swing the, the negative one over on, that's on the left side. If you add it over to the right, get y equals x minus three. <clears throat> Sweet, that was super helpful. Um, Professor, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to head out now. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We'll see yeah, you later. Yeah, thank you. See ya. Bye. <clears throat> All right. Um, well, it looks like it's just you and me. So <laughs> what would you like to go over? or talk about or do. Review for Trig. Um, Can you get a little bit more specific? 
Like there's a lot of trick. <laughs> uh, so like evaluating or inverse trig functions, um, do you know, is it kind of what you're getting at? Uh, evaluating in general. So like sine of pi over two, like that sort of thing. Okay. So start. So pi is mostly okay. It's once we start involving arbitrary values that it starts to fall flat. Um, <clears throat> not quite sure what you mean by arbitrary values. So if there's a variable in there, there isn't anything to evaluate. So are you, are you talking more about when you're doing the derivative of a trig function when the angle is not just an X? Is that what you meant? Because when, Okay, because when you say like evaluate a trig function, it's meaning like you're, you're doing like like sine of pi over two or cosine of pi over six. Um, so the, the, you wouldn't necessarily have a variable in there anymore. Um, but we can certainly do the derivatives. Okay, so if f. of x is equal to, oh, let's just pick on sine. So sine cubed of four x. <clears throat> so when you have the derivative of a trig function with exponents, that's when you can follow a uh, PTA. So you've got the power the T would be for the trig. And the A would be for the angle. <laughs> so we just got to start kind of go in an order um, and then we can kind of clean things up and get our final derivative. So for the power, you're gonna take the power on the trig function, that three, you're gonna drop it down. And then the power decreases by one. So that'd be sine squared.
<clears throat> and then the angle stays the same. So that right there, was just the P. So now we still have the trig and we still have to do the angle. So if you look at the trig function that's in this example, the trig function, just the trig function is sine. And the derivative of sine is cosine. And it has the same angle. And the last thing to do is multiply by the derivative of the angle. So the derivative or the angle is 4x, and then its derivative was is 4. And that's the angle part. So from here, it's just a matter of kind of cleaning stuff up, which is mostly just multiplying any constants together. Uh, it's like 3 times 4 is 12. Uh, personally, and I said it this earlier, um, I like the trig functions with powers on them to come at the end, uh, but it's not necessary to do. Um, so if I was writing it out, I would write the cosine part next. And then I would write the sine squared uh, at the end, but it's not something that you have to do. Just to me, I think it looks a little nicer. <clears throat> and there you go. So something that might be a little useful as well, like when you see powers on trig functions like that, um, It's like sine to the third of 4x. You can kind of rewrite it a little bit. That's like the sine of 4x. And then the whole thing is to the third power. So if it helps to write it that way or to think of it that way, then go for it. Um, <clears throat> some people just get a little bogged down when the exponent's here as opposed to here. So whichever way is easier, <clears throat> do it that way. And because then everything else would stay the same. The power would still come down, it would decrease by one. Then you attack the trig part and then you attack the, the sine or the, uh, the angle part. <clears throat> so is that kind of like what you were looking for? Maybe. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, let me, um, can I clear this? Uh, okay, so the identities to watch out for, they don't come up all the time. Um, but it's just kind of useful to have them in your back pocket. So a couple of the double angle identities and the Pythagorean identities are some good ones to keep in mind. So like sine of 2x, 
Whoops. That would be two sine x cosine x. <clears throat> And then cosine of 2x, there are three different options. So the first one would be cosine squared. Minus sine squared. Second one. Uh, two cosine squared minus one. And then the third one, one minus two sine squared. <clears throat> So the reason why they're useful is because if you were asked to find the derivative of something, you might be able to use an identity to kind of simplify it down a little bit first. So for example, if your function was y equals two sine x cosine x, If you were asked to find the derivative, most people would start to go through the product rule because they have an obvious product there. They have the two sine times the cosine. Well, you don't have to. You could actually use the double angle formula with it. Um, so you could, whoops. you could change it into just sine of 2x. And then your derivative would be a lot quicker. Because the derivative of sine would be cosine. And then the derivative of 2x would just be two. So your derivative would be a lot faster um, if you apply the double angle formula with it. Uh, it's not totally necessary, um, but I can make it quicker. This is also one of the reasons why, um, like if you're doing your homework, sometimes the back of the book might have a different answer than yours. And it's probably because they were doing something like that, or they took an answer and then apply a trig identity into it to kind of collapse it into like one term as opposed to two. So for example, if your answer turned out to be cosine squared minus sine squared, sometimes the book will just automatically change it into cosine of two X. Um, and the reason why they do that is one, to give you practice with the identities and two, to see if you realize that there is one. <laughs> Uh, so it just kind of depends. <clears throat> uh, the other ones to, to kind of know would just be the Pythagorean identities. So like cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, uh, and then the, the two others. Those are the ones that, uh, those identities and these two would come up the most. Um, the more abstract ones like the half angle identities, um, not so much with those. <laughs> well, that's one way. <clears throat> How's it going, Brian? Good. Uh, it's Lord of the Flies downstairs. I've been um, 
studying all day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, nice. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I was with the tutor for a while, so I was just kind of kept with it. And then um, mm. the time was up and I was like, uh, this one, you're recording this too, right? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Where are we at? Is this chapter two? <laughs> um, I They just asked um, about trig identities. And so... Uh, I just kind of, they were just wanting to review. So I just kind of went through a couple of them. Okay. <clears throat> so nothing like real specific, I guess. Okay. Are you um, seeing it like your own tutor? Are you going through the tutoring lab or? Through the lab. Class? Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, I have my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> I would too. All right, let me clear this. <clears throat> All right, so to so you and Weston, so ask away. I was just going through the study guide. I was just kind of doing one after another. Okay. Um, I'm sure I could, if I was working, like if, usually I work through it all and then if I have questions, I bring them up. Um, but I've gone through all of them, so or most of them. I'm just at number four now in, in chapter three. So okay. I looked at it. Number four. Yeah, find the equation of tangent line graph of function given at the point. So f of x equals secant squared pi x. And the x, y is a one, one. OK. <clears throat> so we need um, two things to get you the equation of, of any line. So what two things do we need? Um, well. Mm -hmm. And well, I got to get the derivative of the f of x. Yeah, so that'll give you the slope. Uh, so what's the second thing that's necessary for a line? A point? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because if you don't have either one, then you won't be able to get a line ever. So this one, you have the point, you just need the slope. And you're right, you just need to take the derivative. So we need the derivative of secant squared pi x. So that power is gonna pull down and I was telling Weston earlier too that sometimes it helps if you kind of rewrite that function just a little bit. You can take, you know, any exponent and kind of write it this way if, if that helps. Um, just so it looks more like some of the other ones like some of the polynomials or or something like that okay so like you can pull the two down the power would decrease by one so the f prime is what we're going for okay um yeah. and then nothing happens in inside of it not no uh -uh. so the power decreases by one so that that two changes now to a one. So then you need to do the derivative of the secant. Secant we, tan x. Yeah. So this or the chain. angle has to stay the same. This is chain rule then? Yeah.
And then finally, you can take the derivative of the angle or the derivative of the pi x, which in this case would just be pi. <clears throat> So you've got this massive looking derivative. You put pi on the outside of the last one, tan. Right here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the derivative of pi x. Okay. The derivative of your angle. So this function, you have to use the chain rule twice. So it's like you're using the chain rule within the chain rule. So with trig, fun trig functions, especially because that's those are the most common ones where it happens. That's why there's that PTA technique. Okay. Because that runs through the chain rule with a, in a chain rule. So pulling the power down. Oh, that's what this is. Power. Yeah. Angle is at the end. Okay. So two secant pi x is power, secant pi x, and the pi tan is trig. And then angle. Okay. Yeah. And it's all multiplied together. And that that is it, isn't it? So that's the derivative. Two pi. Bring that pi over. Secant. There's two secants. And then we have pi x. And then tan pi x. And now we have to do uh, of, of one. Now we plug in the one. Yeah. Equals one. So now um, two pi so squared pi times one. Two pi secant squared pi. <clears throat> so the secant squared is where it gets me. Do I still just look for secant pi of pi yeah. in unit circle? Mm -hmm. And okay. then you would square that answer. Whatever it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so two, um, so one over cosine x is a pi one over x negative one. Yep. Negative one squared, which is just a positive one, two pi times, times tan y over x. Uh, zero. So it's all zero. It's all zero. All that work. All that work to get you a slope of zero. And <clears throat> now we have a y minus y one equals n times x minus x one. So we plug in the one and the zero. So the zero basically just is no, there's no M, there's no slope that you don't put the zero in there, right? Because you do. <clears throat> then, okay. So the only okay. time you wouldn't put it in there is if the slope was undefined. Okay. So uh, but if it's zero, yeah, go ahead and throw that in there. Um, because that makes it nice because it knocks everything out on the right side, knocks it all out. So y equals one. So y is one. OK. 
Okay. <clears throat> All right. I would have been second guessing myself when the zero came in. Oh. <laughs> then I'd be like, oh, there is no answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, um, there, there should always, like, if I ask you for the tangent line, there will always be a line, no matter what the slope okay. is. So even if it comes out as undefined, there's still a line. Just means it's vertical. So, so for some reason, let's say your slope did come out as undefined. Mm -hmm. You can still give a, a line, like say the point was, was still one, it was like one, two. Mm -hmm. If it's an undefined slope, that means that your line is gonna be X equals uh, whatever the Y coordinate or the X coordinate is. Okay. When it's horizontal or when the slope is zero like this, <clears throat> then it's whatever the y coordinate. Yeah. yeah. So if the slope was zero and it was still one, two, then your line would just be y equals two. <clears throat> but yeah, I'll always give a tangent line if it's asking for one. Uh, even if your slope is undefined or zero or whatever. Because at least you'll get the line. Um, and chances are you only made like one little error somewhere else. So you would have lost like maybe one point as opposed oh. to losing two or three if you stop. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Use implicit differentiation to find dy over dx. So is this right of me to say wherever uh, you there is a y, you put a dy over dx? In yes. The derivative. Okay. Some tutors get a little confused by that because they, there. I have one tutor say they put in dx over dy by all the x's and dy dx over next to the y's. No. Okay. I could be uh, like hearing it wrong too, like not fully understanding what they're saying either. They might have said when you do the derivative of an x to put a dx over dx? No, it was like a the opposite. It was like- It was flipped. Yeah. It, yeah, that, that's not correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> because you're taking the derivative of x with respect to x, you're not taking the derivative of x with respect to y. Okay. If it was with respect to y, then you'd be multiplying by that dx over dy. Okay. But then the y terms wouldn't have anything. Okay. So the rule would just kind of kind of flip-flop. <clears throat> um, did any of the tutors want to use y prime <clears throat> as opposed to dy dx? Um, I haven't seen a lot of the no. Okay. But, but whenever you say use implicit differentiation, I know that's when the dy over dx is solved for, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So finding the this one, it, it doesn't have a f of x before it or anything. So does that no? And it, and it shouldn't because it's a function of x and y. Okay. Um. So if it's a, if it's yeah, it, it it wouldn't say that. Okay, so I don't put, so you just put it, that's why you were just putting like a D next to it. Is that right? Like you were saying derivative. I guess it wasn't really an official term of just saying we're finding the derivative. Yeah, so like with implicit, you're not starting it, like you wouldn't say like F prime. Yeah. 
So, but we're fine. We are yeah. finding the the derivative of this. So yes, yeah. So for each one, e to the x is e to the x. Like yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the der. So do we do um, sine dy d over dx, or do we do sine y dy or over dx, or we do do we do cosine? Cosine. Y. Okay. Cosine. What with the y with the dy over dx? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm not on the page. And then the right side would just be, it would just be one. <clears throat> and then from there, uh, you're just trying to get the dy dx by itself. So I would just swing over the e to the x, just subtract it. And then divide by cosine y? Yeah. You got it. And that's it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, because there's no, they didn't want a point or they didn't want a tangent line or a slope or anything. So yeah, once you get it, you're done. Whoops. Wow. Part B on that one, on number five, you'd have to use the product rule on that second term. But that's kind of the only, that's the big difference between the, between parts A and B. X plus X, Y equals A, and that's product rule. Um, so if you start so like for x times y you'd have the derivative of x which is one times the y and then plus the derivative of the y which is one dy dx. So, okay. Times the x. So, x equals one. Oh. The D, that's always where I, I forget dy over dx is the, I think I want to make it one, like the x is one. Uh, F prime, g prime. Okay, so F one times g y plus so the derivative one plus y plus dy over dx x plus one equals zero. So you're doing minus y, minus y, minus one, minus one, dy, dx. 
x equals negative 1 minus 1 over x, x to y dx equals negative y, negative 1 over x. Not quite. No. There's a second dy dx. Oh, the y. Oh. Plus y term. Okay, so the y's in there still, but the yeah. dy dx is added to it. Okay, or yeah. multiplied. D yeah. So you have the y still attached to the other one. Y dy dx. So then you take out a dy. Okay. Yeah. You got the negative one over there though. Okay. So negative y. <clears throat> So how is it that you can separate the dy over dx from the y just by without without division or because I thought it was a part of it one y which dy dx are you talking about the, this, the this? not the first one we did the second the one y one plus one times y that one. The, one plus one times y. That one, yeah. That's so, one. so the one that's just the derivative of the x. Yes. That single x term. Yeah. And then the, after the plus, that's when we use the product rule. Yes. Okay. So that's coming from that that x y term. Yeah, but they're connected. The one, the whenever you put a y, whenever there's a y, you put the dy dx, so it's well, like multiplied to it. So I take the derivative of the y, you get a dy dx. Not every time you write y. Yeah, that would. Be, so I thought that the y was still with it. No, because we did the derivative of x to get you this one. Oh, okay. Times the y. And then plus, now we're doing the derivative of y. So that's the one dy dx, and then times the x. So then you, but then there's a second. So you, you so, take derivative of the y, I thought, again. Yeah. Wait. One. I erased too many and added too many things here. Let me. <laughs> okay. So one. Okay, so we have a one plus one y plus dy over dx x plus one. So did you, did you get it or is there something still off? I took a picture of it if you want to move on. No, you're the only one here. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> um, sometimes I need to do it step by step again, even though we did it step by step. So that's okay. Okay, so I do understand what's going on up top right next to the B. I understand it. 
It's just uh, we take the derivative again because we did the x, y product rule. So we take their derivative of x, which is a, we, we have one, but that goes away again. We're doing the derivative again. Or no, you minus no. Okay. So the x, y, I understand we have one y plus one dy over dx minus x. Or that's times x, not minus. Oh, oh times, yes, times x. And then um, you brought over the y, but you added a dy over dx from something. Well, because your original function was x plus xy plus y equals eight. The y is a dx, okay. Yeah, so that's why like here, I've got those kind of brackets over everything. Okay. So that first one is coming from the x, the oh, I didn't. I, I I took the derivative of it, but didn't. Okay, I put a one there. I didn't put the dy dx. Okay. Yeah. That's where I, I didn't write it in. Okay. Dy over dx <laughs> equals zero, and then okay, I could take it from there. Yeah. Okay. okay. So. Yeah, from there. Negative. Four. Yeah, you just anything without a dy dx on it, one. just put it on the right side, and on the left side, then we'll factor that dy dx out yeah okay and then we can finally divide negative one negative y dy dx one plus x wait no yeah mm -hmm. that's right yep negative one minus y and then we can do one plus x so divide it by that yeah right okay yep <clears throat> So dy dx equals negative one, negative y over one plus x. Okay, or x plus one. Either way, either way works, right? Or would yeah. you rather have the, the x first? Um, it, no, it's up to you. Okay. okay, six, oh gosh, here we go. <laughs> Let me pause this real quick <laughs> or mute it. I was just going to go to the next one. Okay. Um, what's, he, what's he doing? I'll be right back. Sure. All right, um, so number six, I don't see, I have it right here. Six, a particle moves along the x axis, that one. Particle. is given by, I have a real problem with these ones. What's, uh, what's the problem? I just get, I gotta look at the notes. I, let's see, where T is. Mm -hmm. 
So for position, velocity, and acceleration, like if you have position, how would you get uh, velocity? Um. <clears throat> you would just uh, do its derivative. So the derivative of position gives you velocity. And then if you have velocity and you're trying to get acceleration, you're gonna do the derivative again. So the derivative of the position equals velocity? Yeah. And the derivative of velocity is gonna equal acceleration. <clears throat> so if you have position and you're trying to get all the way to acceleration, you're going to have to do the derivative twice. Okay. So first we have position is x t equals t squared plus sine t. Um, so the derivative of that which is v t equals two t plus cosine t. Is that right? Velocity equals two t plus cosine t. Oh. Yep, you got it. And then, would it? What is it? Notation of acceleration a of t or uh, yeah a of t equals uh, two plus minus wait plus negative sine t am I doing that wrong or two t Sign, negative sign, yeah, negative sign t? Uh, two minus sign t. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And then, so those are your velocity and acceleration functions, and they want to know what it is when, for both of them, when t equals pi. So then just stick pi into both. seconds. So v of t, v of, v of pi equals 2 minus sine y, 2 minus um, y, 0 is 2 seconds. So the velocity would be two pi minus one. <clears throat> but the pi of sine. But I was talking about velocity. So velocity doesn't have a sine in there. So remember velocity was two t plus cosine t. Uh-huh. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, yeah, sorry. Oh, you're good. Plus cosine t pi. Okay, so that's negative one 
equals one second. No, two pi minus one. Oh. So just plug pi into T and evaluate it. And that's I was all I doing the acceleration again. Okay, so oh, okay. pi equals two times pi. Okay, two pi minus one. And you just leave yeah. it. Yep. And there are no, like you don't. No unit. Yeah, because you don't know the, just the, um, the length unit. Like you don't know if it's feet or meters or whatever. Um, so you can't really give units with this. The only units you have are for time. Um, so you just leave the units off. Okay. Two, now two minus zero. Yeah. Equals two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's that. Mm -hmm. Differentiability implies continuity. Maybe skip to nine. Uh, sure. All right, so <clears throat> the F be the function defined below, where C and D are constants. Uh, if F is differentiable at X equals two, what are the values of C? Uh, indeed. So if it's differentiable at x equals two, that's also telling you uh, that it's continuous at x equals two. So we're going to have to do two different things here. So one of them is to take the derivative and at least go with that. Um. Everything? Yep. Okay. So the derivative of that top line, that CX plus D, the C and the D, they're not variables. So they're just constants. So the derivative of CX plus D is just C. Plus D? No, the D would go to zero. Oh, oh, because there's no one, okay. Yeah, because it's just, the D is the constant. And then for X squared plus six C X, that derivative would be um, two X uh, plus six C. And then the, the restrictions are still the same. So because they told you that it's differentiable, that means that if you actually plugged in two into both of these derivatives, that has to give you the same result uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be differentiable there. So once you get the derivative, you can plug the two. Into C? In, or... Well, in for all your X's. Okay. Both there is more. So, yeah, so the first one doesn't have any X's, so it just stays as C. And then it's going to equal when you plug two into the second function. Or the second, the um, the second line of that derivative. So that would be four uh, plus six c. Yeah. 
And now you can solve for C. So C is going to equal negative four fifths. <clears throat> So you found one of your one of your uh, constants. So now you get now you have to get the d. So the d, that's we're going to get that from the um, knowing that it's continuous. So for the continuous part, if you plug two into um, both lines of the original function, they would also have to be equal. So you're going to go back to the original, plug two in for x. So the first line, if you did that, that would be 2c plus d. The second line, if you did it, it would be 4. Uh, plus 12c. So you can subtract the 2c all the way over to the right side. So d equals uh, 4 plus 10c. Kind of looks like a 0. And now take the C that you got or, the, or that we found earlier and plug that in. Negative four. Yeah. Because they're different, they're not continuous or not. Oh, Aren't because we the C and the D are different. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't matter. They can be different. Because you're just you're just trying to find what C and D are. Okay. You're not. Um, you don't need to worry about if it makes it continuous because it, it told you that it, it was differentiable, so you know it's continuous. Okay. Second derivative. Okay. Y equals three sine. 5x. Okay. This was kind of on the quiz, kind of, wasn't it? On the last one? I think so. Something. Um, there was one like it on an earlier one, I think. I want to say it had a cotangent in there, maybe, but I could be wrong. Um, uh, either either way, you would do it the same way. Second derivative. Okay. Um, so. Okay. So you got to get the first. So the three stays as three. 
the derivative of sine is cosine. Is this uh, the power trig? No. Mm -hmm. Do we do it that way? You, you can do it that way. Okay. When, it, when you're doing it this way, if the power of the trig function is a one, then, yeah. then the, there really isn't a, the power part of it. Yeah. So you can skip it and I'll show you why. It's a one and then cosine. Because you would drop the one down. Yeah, and it's times one, right? Yeah, and then the, you decrease the power by one. So if you decrease one by one, it makes the power of zero. Yeah. Which knocks that term out anyway. Okay, so there is no trig term or there is? No, there is. Oh, there, the power is gone. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then cosine five X. Mm -hmm. And then the angle is, do we take the derivative of five X or just? Yeah. The, So we still have cosine in there. Cosine yeah. Five. Yeah. Oh, so five x times five. I always forget about that. That's bad. Times five. And that is um. That is the chain rule. Yes. Okay. So now we can do fifth. Three times five is 15. 15. So when the power is just one, <clears throat> You, you really don't have to do the power part of PTA. You can just kind of skip it because that whole term is going to cancel out. <clears throat> you can do it if you want, um, but you're going to get the same answer if you do it or if you skip it. <laughs> okay, would there be a better way of doing it then then just just do the derivative of sine is cosine and the derivative of 5x is 5. okay that'd be easier <laughs> i think you know not so much writing involved yeah so the pta you really only use it when there's an actual power on the trig function okay yeah um otherwise you, you don't have to it's just doing the derivative of the trig times the derivative of the angle and that's all you do. So like for your second derivative, the 15 is gonna just stay as 15. Derivative of the cosine is negative sine. And then the derivative of your 5x is 5. And that's your derivative. For the most part, you just have to multiply your constants together, kind of clean it up. So it'd be negative 75 uh, sine of 5x. Eleven a baseball diamond has the shape of a square with sides ninety feet long. Let's draw the diamond. Uh, as, yeah, I will do my best. 
and then sides are 90 feet. From second base to third base. Just 25 feet per second. So 90 minus 20 is 20. Base to, oh, second to third. I was thinking first to second. I think the answer, if you did from first to second, I think the answer would come out almost exactly the same, except it would be opposite. Okay. So like this one, I think you your answer, the, this one, the answer would be negative. And if you're running, if you was running from first to second, the answer would be positive. <clears throat> but otherwise, if you did it, it like all the work and all the numbers, I think would be the same for the most part. So this is that like that no, the given the find. So the no, you've got this right triangle and it's giving you a bunch of distances and lengths and whatnot. So the formula that you're gonna wanna use with this is gonna be, yeah. You got it. Equals 90 or plus 90. So you take what you're given. Mm -hmm. I had, need to look back at it. I don't have it on my screen. So he's writing from second to third at a speed of 25 feet per second. So the length of that X side, is that getting uh, smaller or is it getting larger? as he runs. Oh, smaller. Smaller. So that means that that rate, that dx dt, is a negative 25. If it was the other way around, if he was running from first to second, that X length would be getting larger and larger. So then it would be positive. He's 20, 20 feet from third base. Okay, so that's your X. And you're looking for the rate of change or what rate is the player's distance from home plate? Oh, Z. I, I use C. <laughs> um, changing. So we're looking for uh, DC. Oh. Uh, dc dt or if you use the variable in the, the problem dz dt <clears throat> so how do you get the dc or the dz dt to show up 
Is that because right now you don't have one? So find dz of dt and the dc was the c squared. Um, well, first we got to take the derivative of what we know. Yeah. So 2x times dx dt. And then plus the derivative of the 90 squared that's just zero because it's just a number. Equals two Z, or did you put Z in there? I use C, but um, I mean, it wouldn't matter. I, I forgot that I was was specific to Z, but I picked C, so I, it was easier okay. to draw. <laughs> so two Z C C D C D T. Yeah. And, and now you can start plugging in your numbers. We have x equals 20. Dx. Do we leave out the dx dt? Because that's just telling us derivative, right? Or no, dx dt is the rate. OK. Yeah. Negative 25. And usually, like when you start plugging in your values, usually what happens is you're going to start plugging them in, and then all of a sudden you're going to be like, oh, wait, I don't, I'm missing one. So in this case, it's that C. Because we don't know what C equals, they didn't tell us, but you can use your, your equation again uh, and find it. So we know X is uh, 20. So 20 squared plus 90 squared is equal to C squared. So 400 plus 1800. Or 8100. Yeah, 8100. C squared, square root it. Oh, God. You're gonna make me do that. So it'd be um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 10 root 85. Whoops. Okay. So now we can put that in where C is. Yeah. And we don't have DC, we're solving for that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what I would do is instead of trying to multiply all that out, is I would wait and I would just start to divide. Because you need to divide by that two times 10 root 85 anyway, whether you multiply it out or not. So we cancel the twos and the 10 and 20 goes to two. So <clears throat> two times 25, negative 50 over Oops. 80 square root 85. Okay, 
Am I going to have to rationalize this? Uh, yeah. Fifty square root eighty five over eighty five, and that can be reduced. Equals ten or fifty. Seventeen square root eighty five. Oh, wait, you got it. Five square root eighty five. Wait, sorry. So take a five out from the fifty and the eighty five. That's I don't know why my brain wasn't. Looking. Okay, negative 10 square root 85 over 17. Got it. And then the units uh, would still be uh, feet per second. So far, my son has just broken the blind cord. <laughs> and the cat is throwing up. <laughs> Uh, good Not times. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> All right, your time was up, huh? Yeah, that's okay. okay. <sighs> um, I'm going to just continue working on it. Um, I just don't, um, I've just been neglecting my children. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta choose. Um, okay. So what we got next? Let's see. Either you, or um, so I, I, I will have to go, um, yeah. but like for your studying and stuff, mm -hmm. you could, uh, you want to probably skip 12 and 13 uh, and do 14 and I would still probably be pretty complete. Okay. Just saying. Okay. All right. So um, you're saying you got to go now, right? All right. Um, Were you saying you have to go or are you saying you can do 14? Oh, no, I was saying I have to go. Okay, yeah, I should go anyway. Um, 14, um, I mean, that's just the slope of the tangent line. Okay. <clears throat> there we go. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, bye-bye. All right, bye.